Hi, I'm Suzanne Schneider, Deputy Director at the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research. I'm here with our faculty member, Rebecca Ariel Port, to talk about an upcoming class that she's offering called Cold Pastoral. Welcome. Hi. So, first of all, what does that mean, Cold Pastoral? What exactly is that in your mind, or, or what are we trying to convey with a class like this? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, cult pastoral is this phrase that comes from a famous canonical poem by the British romantic poet John Keats, mm -hmm. um, and it's the Ode on a Grecian Urn. Um, and what it refers to is these images on the side of a Grecian urn um, that are frozen in time, and particularly frozen in this agrarian, rural, idealized mm -hmm. landscape. Um, so they're appealing um, in that they suggest to us some kind of pure nature out there in which humans live in harmony with the non -human. So like we haven't screwed anything up yet. Yeah, and the uh -huh. natural world. Um, and on the other hand, the price of all of that uh, abundance and plenitude, um, flowers and um, kisses that are, that are always on the verge of consummation. Um, the price of that is that we can never move forward in time, right? The uh -huh. bold so lover never, never place. can kiss the beloved. So cold yeah. pastoral does not refer to like a chaplain who has very poor bedside manner. No, like yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's funny, like this term pastoral, which does have these kinds of sacred connotations, yeah. particularly in the Christian religious right, for sure. tradition, um, is actually, um, it goes back to that kind of ancient analogy between um, the, the church or a leader in the church and uh, a shepherd and his flock, oh, right? Oh, super so, fascinating. So yeah. there actually is a like a, a, a real yeah. connection there. Yeah, because the characters in pastoral literature, which takes place out in mm -hmm. nature and out in these kinds of seemingly pristine areas, um, is often um, peopled by shepherds and their flocks, uh -huh. um, is often peopled um, by these kinds of uh, figures who would only occupy a landscape that has not yet been tainted by um, mm -hmm. civilization. So pastoralism is about uh -huh. this kind of herding thing, but it's also about um, the sheep and the shepherd existing in the kind of um, open plenitude of, so, of the country. <laughs> the And you know, this class is looking particularly at how these, how these tropes of the pastoral or kind of nature in general yeah. get uh, reflected or refracted, uh, you know, yeah. through different literary products yeah. from, you know, short stories to poetry, yeah. ethics, and, and, and so yeah. forth. Um, I mean, when you think about that, like how important is literature for shaping the way that we think about nature, for example? Oh, incredibly important, right? And, and literature not only for thinking through um, what this category of nature, it's a really vast category, yeah. right? We have all sorts of conversations about whether there is such a thing as nature, right? Whether we can think of everything that's an object of human knowledge as being constructed in some ways, or anything that's an object of, um, of our study of kind of um, biology or something, mm -hmm. right? You know, what is natural? Um, so literature has a long relationship to this question. Um, and particularly literature that is interested in some ways in figuring what it might be like to live in a world that's better than the one that we currently inhabit, um, in which our relation to nature isn't broken. Um, well, yeah. it's we are right when you think of right the uh, notions of, of 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 paradise, of the you yeah. know kind of the kind of classical images of those, like the the natural yeah. imagery is of course kind of crucial to that. It's this yeah. like land of abundance. Yeah. Um, and uh, I know you're going to be talking a, a bit in the class about these kind of constructions of paradise. Do you want yeah. to say anything about that? Yeah. Um, so paradise is often conceived of as a garden, and uh -huh. its um, initial etymology is is a garden. Arcadia is is slightly different. Um, that's a vision of a of a natural world that's not just a garden, but it's kind of out there, and we live in it. Whereas a garden is a kind of more constructed, yeah. bounded kind Space. of arena. Yeah. Um, but this is a vision um, in the pastoral of a nature that we can't be alienated from. Uh -huh. um, so 
uh, there's a way of thinking about um, nature as being this kind of passive entity that is just kind of out there for our exploitation. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's very problematic for all sorts yeah. of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there are questions that the pastoral brings up um, about whether it is possible to have any kind of workable relationship with nature that is also a relationship of mastery, right? Yeah, so I was going to say that there's this right there, as a kind of complete non-experts just speaking yeah. uh, uh, on this, it seems like there's this kind of like two major, you know, right, cultural themes that you see yeah. pop up all over the place. One is exactly nature is this is resource, is something that exists out there to be mastered, to be dominated, and to yeah. be exploited. Yeah. And the other is like nature as refuge. Yeah. Right, the like, let's get out of the city and go upstate and go yeah. on a hike, and right, yeah. and, and 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 nature is escape, um, and nature is something which is like the antithesis of uh, uh, modern life and, and and all the stresses of modernity. Yeah. How do those two things come together in the literature that you're you're looking at, and is this just a wholly a modern? Notion yeah. that was like nature is escape, or do are the to an extent do these kind of themes you know find themselves uh, existing in like pre modern works as well? Yeah, so it's often characterized as a hallmark of modernity, this sense of alienation from the yeah. natural world. That gets really a lot more complicated when you think about pre modern texts and you realize that it's all the way back there in these. Um, very ancient works like Hesiod's works and days, yeah. um, which is thinking about how um, you know people live in an age of iron when before in the golden age it used to be uh -huh. like, things were um, different in the, the land of milk and honey, perfect uh -huh. abundance without labor, without yeah. our needing to force anything from from the earth. So you see that even in these really really ancient texts. Um, but there's already a sense of alienation, which is not to say it's not reflected historically. I mm -hmm. really don't want to make a case that this is like a trans historical yeah. concept. It's not, it's not essentializing, right? Yeah. Um, but the fact is that I would say that each age gets the alienation from <laughs> nature that it deserves <laughs> in the same way that each age gets the notion of nature that, that, it, it, that it deserves. It, yes, yeah. that it constructs. Um, and so in many ways, um, I mean, there's this old phrase from uh, the, the 18th century philosopher John Battista Vico, the truth is the maid. Uh -huh. um, and in some ways that means that what we can know of the world is what we make of it. Um, uh -huh. And nature has been one of the most kind of robust categories for making something of what we know of the world, yeah. even as we know that it comes with all sorts of associated ethical and aesthetic and political problems. Uh, to use that category in a kind of unthinking um, or naive way. Um, so the pastoral is so complicated on this. I think of a text that's on the syllabus, which is Shakespeare's As You Like It, um, uh -huh. which goes along with one of the most famous definitions of the pastoral in a nutshell from a critic called William Empson, which is that it is putting the complex into the simple. So all these aristocrats from a court um, go out into the forest of Arden. Arden whose name is associated with flame and fire and passion and mm -hmm. the kind of uncontrolled. And it's this sort of um, green land in which the dramas of civilization can be worked out. Um, and then you can go back, taking the knowledge that you have gained in this pastoral world to civilization, like you're done with nature. And the truth is that the divide is not often yeah, that's so, so neat. Clear. <laughs> yeah. well, I mean, that's one of the, I guess the notion of that kind of design, divide is like the starkness of like yeah. what is the natural world versus like what is the, the social yeah. or the constructed one is really fascinating, particularly in these like urban places, right? We go yeah. to like places like Central Park or like yeah. Prospect Park is yeah. our, our kind of our getaways, our escapes yeah. into nature, and these are completely constructed. Yeah, right? they, <laughs> are, <laughs> they are completely constructed by the Olmsteads in this case. Yeah. Um, and also, um, in certain ways, um, you know, those things were never not imbricated with the human, which is a point that's made in a in a kind of canonical essay of eco-criticism by uh, William Cronin called The Trouble with Wilderness. Uh -huh. um, and so one thing that I always think of when I am kind of moving through the palimpsest of New yeah. York City, say, um, is what Central Park is built on, right? Yeah. And it's, it's not merely um, that it is built over the kind of remains of of, of the natural world, but of over, you know, earlier habitations, yeah. um, the Lenape Indians, right? Yeah, um, or the, the, the potter's fields in lower Manhattan, yeah. where um, the unnamed dead um, are buried. So those palimpsests, I think, 
um, are still with us. Palimpsest goes back to the pastoral because it's this word that um, used to mean uh, the, the very physical material process of scraping down a piece of parchment, which was made from animal hide, uh -huh. sheep's hide, right? Oh, to get down to, like where, to you get down down write to where you could write on it. And so these kinds of older things, because the parchment is never perfectly scraped down, yeah. persist in our experience of nature and particularly mm -hmm. in urban environments for those of us who inhabit those places. And even places that we would consider remote yeah. Um, we can't stop knowing them as human observers, right? Yeah. Like, you know, there's another essay um, called What Is It Like to Be a Bat by Thomas Nagel, <laughs> right? Which concludes essentially that, you know, like, well, we can't really know what it's like <laughs> to be a bat. Like, we're sort of stuck with we're that. We're limited. <laughs> so it also is a, an issue, the pastoral, and it's tropes that crystallizes this problem of the fact that you have to know what is other than you from your own experience, your own experience from your own human position mm -hmm. and that in fact even as we need to think about um what the post-human looks yeah. like right um for all sorts of reasons having to do with climate change having right. to do with the fact that material conditions really do mean that it changes what societies look like and what it means to be a subject in the first place that we also have to consider the idea that we are not done with the really really messy business of the human yeah. uh, in the first place that is so fascinating. Thank you so much for chatting with me about this. I feel a hundred times smarter. Uh, if you want to check this out in person, please see the link on the page below and hope you guys are doing great. Bye.